Hi, this is Eddie Fitzgerald. I'm here to talk about Aristocat by Chuck Jones. This is a fantastic bullseye and just the best Warner's music. Of all the versions they did of this music, this is the best. It just gives a cartoon a great start. Nobody ever improved on the Warner's bullseye formula. Don't forget to take good care of my baby while I'm gone. Well, here we are, a little suspended interest here. We're wondering what it's all about because we only see close-ups. This is a Jones cartoon, but evidently he's interested, he's influenced by Tashlin. A little bit of cinematic stuff going on there. And here we introduce our main character. The cat looks a little bit like Sniffles. Jones loved the character of Sniffles, and for years he just really enjoyed putting Sniffles-type characters into everything. This character later morphed into Claude the Cat who later on is sort of orange instead of black, but this is the first, or one of the first times we see him. Yes, this voice, which is unusual for Mel Blanc, who did most of the voices here. Some mice coming later that I think were done by Ted Pierce and Mike Maltese. The voices, I mean. Wow, look at the way the butler stays there and the background changes. Well, he stays the same. Well, here's the style that this cartoon is famous for, pioneered by the layout artist John McGrew, who kind of talked Jones into it, although Jones was willing. That's what I love about Chuck. At this time especially, he was willing to experiment. Now, that looked like Chuck animation when the cat was coming down the steps on the side there. Rudy Lariva is credit with most of the important animation in the film. Anyway, the style here is amazing, absolutely amazing. I think they were a little bit cautious about it because people hadn't done much of the style in film before. Maybe Dover Boys and something else, but it was still a new thing. UPA hadn't come about yet. People weren't used to seeing these abstract designs, so maybe they played it a little bit conservative. They made the colors very muted, mixed everything with light gray. This is very drastic, and it really underlines the fact that the cat is alone now. There's something about the psychotic nature of those stripes and everything that say, boy, this cat is really, <laughs> is really on his own now. The whole thing is getting surreal. He was so confident before. What's this? The beginning of this cartoon is one of my very favorite Chuck Jones beginnings. Now we're going to segue into what essentially is the second half of the film. Now, Chuck could have expanded this part of the film. He could have made it a big deal. He could have made the cat really flamboyant. I suppose maybe somebody like Tashlin or Clampett would have done that, given him a lot of funny lines, you know, showed him with the butler doing meaner and meaner things to the butler and making a big deal. It could have even been a Halloween cartoon in the sense that maybe the cat is stuck in the house all alone and it's a scary house and really that could have been the texture of the entire cartoon instead of just the beginning. But Chuck decided, and Ted Pierce, the writer, to make it a two-part cartoon where the beginning, the vulnerability of the cat, just sets up the second part, which so far as screen time goes is the biggest part of the film. Boo. Now, they still have these things. You could argue these abstract backgrounds. You could argue that, gee, maybe the backgrounds should be a little more conventional, and they get abstract when the cat realizes that he's really alone in the house. I'm not sure about that. That's the kind of thing you could say in hindsight looking back on it. But this is new stuff at the time. Nobody knew how to handle this type of thing. I'm glad he did it. It's an interesting idea. I like the way Chuck experiments. Hey, Bite, come here. This is one of the first appearances of Yubi and Birdie. I think the voices are Mike Maltese and Ted Pierce, the writers. Also actors. No. Yeah. Chuck did a lot of Sniffles cartoons around this time, and I it's a Sniffles feeling about the second part of this cartoon. Could you? Sir, I mean, would you? I love this type of voice. That's one of the things that connects it with Claude, who's drawn a little bit differently later, but I think it's still the same cat. It's definitely the same voice. What you want is a mouse. Yes, I know, but uh, I can't seem to locate one. Don't let that Beautiful animation. We'll show you 
And I love the way when characters talk, their head, you know, bobs toward you and away from you as well as, you know, forward and backwards. These guys weren't afraid to draw anything. Tremendous draftsmen at the studio. Oh my, it's an awfully large mouse, isn't it? Dad, you're hungry, ain't you? Then go on, eat it. Here's the Warner's Bulldog. The thing about vulnerability of the cat, Orwell said about Kipling once, he said, gee, Kipling is a... His poems are so memorable because he takes moments that everybody's lived that just don't appear in other poetry. Things that are really, maybe not so subtle, but just too commonplace for other poets. And Kipling will reformulate those things in a way so that when these things happen in your life, you always refer back to the poem. And gee, you know, I refer back to this cartoon constantly when I think about things in my own life, when I suddenly become vulnerable, you know, where before I was really confident, I suddenly realized, gee, this is horrible. I, <laughs> everything's falling apart. I'm, if you can get a feeling like that into a cartoon, if you've really put your name on a human emotion, if you or a human situation that we've all felt, it's that you do the ultimate version of that, I think people remember that for a long time. It sort of carves your name in eternity. I think Jones did that. I don't know of any cartoon about vulnerability that hits home the way this does. Incidentally, this could have been a Daffy cartoon if you only isolate the beginning of it, because Daffy's the kind of guy who would treat people real bad and then suddenly realize that he was alone and needed them, only couldn't get it. Oh, here's Vaud. Vaudeville says, get out. As soon as you've done it, get out of there. Leave after the climax. And they did. Thanks for listening. <laughs>